Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, all right, great. I see someone in the back there. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I live in California now, but I grew up in Minnesota, so I'm no, no stranger to cold weather, so, so don't, don't worry about me. Um, so I'm at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and uh, I've spent my career studying uh, extrasolar planets or exoplanets, and I wanted to showcase uh, today what's been learned from the Kepler mission, which is a NASA mission that's been finding uh, thousands of planets around other stars. Uh, so let's, let's get right into it, I guess. So the first thing I want you to think about is, is a map. Okay, this is a map of the Western Hemisphere, a map of the New World from the year 1550. And so I'm not gonna show this again until the very end, but I want you to think about the, the realm of exoplanets. Before Kepler, we really didn't have a map of what extrasolar planetary systems looked like. There wasn't really a good diagram we could go off of. What we have now is kind of a map that looks like this. We now kind of know what exoplanetary systems generally look like. But like a map like this, you can see that the boundaries are probably, oh, not too bad, but there's no work yet done on the inland. No one's actually done the really hard work to go traverse the continents and find out what it's like on the inside. And so with exoplanets, we're a little bit like that. Kepler has really shown us for the first time what this outline looks like, and that's what my talk is today. But we still have the future where we have to do all the really hard work to find out what these planets are actually like. We know that they're there now. We know what the systems are like, but eventually we need to characterize the atmospheres of the planets to find out what they're truly like, if they are like Earth or if they are like other planets that we know of. And so we'll come back to this at the very end. So the first thing to mention, planets come in different sizes, right? So we've got gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, mostly hydrogen and helium. We've got planets like Uranus and Neptune, which are actually mostly made of uh, a dense liquid form of, of water. Uh, there's a thin skin of hydrogen and helium at the top, but they're actually mostly uh, other stuff, mostly rock and water. There's very little hydrogen and helium, only about 10%. So we've got planets like Earth and Venus, uh, Mercury and Mars, rock iron objects. Earth is about two-thirds rock, about one-third iron. So planets come in different sizes, but all these sizes are small, okay? This is another model of, uh, this is the sun, and we've got our same eight planets down here. So the radius, the, the size of Jupiter, is about one-tenth the size of the sun. The size of the Earth is about one-tenth the size of Jupiter, about one one-hundredth the, the diameter. So if you imagine the, the cross-sectional area, the area you see, the area is the size squared, so Earth is only about one ten-thousandth the area of the sun and only one one-millionth the volume of the sun. This is one of the reasons why it's hard to find planets. They're just much smaller than stars. Another big problem, even more, uh, even more problematic, is that stars are bright, planets are not, okay? The Earth, small planets around sun-like stars are about a million, sorry, a billion to 10 billion times dimmer than the parent star, much dimmer. This is an image over here on the right. This is an actual image of a planet orbiting another star. Uh, but this, this planet is a, is a super Jupiter. It's much more massive than Jupiter. It's very young, it's very hot. It's only about 100,000 times dimmer than its parent star. So that's state of the art right now. We can block out a parent star's light and see a planet that's 100,000 times dimmer. And that's, that's very impressive, right? But if we want to go to even smaller planets, you have to go even fainter, one to 10 billion times fainter than the parent star. So it's very hard to block out the star to find a planet. One of the things that's actually easier to do is to use the star's light to our advantage. Use this bright light bulb and try to find a planet orbiting around the star using the star's light as opposed to using the planet's light. Here we're using the planet's light. And so there's been two methods people have devised that, are, that mostly use the star's light. This is a pretty famous method you might have heard before in previous talks. It's called the radial velocity method or the Doppler wobble method. And that is, uh, in the lower right here, we've got a, a star and a planet, and they actually orbit around each other. They orbit around their common center of mass. So the planet makes a big circle, the star makes a small circle. And so if, let's say we're on Earth, we're looking at a planetary system far away. 
when, the, when they're orbiting around each other, sometimes the star is moving away from us, sometimes the star is moving towards us. And the light can be Doppler shifted, just like the sound of a train can be Doppler shifted from high pitch to low pitch. The sound waves start to pile up, the sound waves spread apart. The same thing happens to light, because light is also a wave. So when the star is coming towards us, you see the star start to look bluer. It's a shorter wavelength of light. When the star is moving away from us, the star's light looks redder. It's a longer wavelength of light. And that happens over and over and over again when the planet's orbiting the star repeatedly over and over and over again. And so this was the first method that people actually used to find exoplanets. Uh, and around 600 planets have actually been found this way, this Doppler, this Doppler wobble method. You just stare at the parent star, you take a spectrum of its light, you break it up into the colors, and you can see the star looking slightly bluer and redder, bluer and redder. You don't actually see the planet at all. All you see is the parent star's light. The method we'll be talking about for the rest of our talk is another method people have used uh, where they use the parent star's light to show us a planet. And this is called the transit method. And this is where a planet passes directly in front of its parent star. So what you measure here is you measure just the brightness of the star. You measure the brightness of the star as a function of time. And for a short amount of time, maybe a few hours, uh, the planet passes right in front of the parent star. And we're actually, what we see is the planet's shadow, right? That's what we see. We don't see the planet itself. We see the planet's shadow. And for a while, a small fraction of the parent star's light is blocked out. And when the transit's over, this parent star goes back to its normal brightness. So all you're doing is monitoring the brightness of the star. And so we're using the star's light, but of course we can only see systems that are almost exactly edge on, right? We need to see from our vantage point at Earth, we need to see this planet pass directly in between us and the star. And of course some planetary systems are gonna be lined face on or some other orientation, and we wouldn't be able to see those systems. But for some systems that we see almost edge on, we can find planets this way. This is actually pretty hard also um, a Jupiter-sized planet, that were, if we were to pass in front of, the, of a sun-like star, would block out about 1% of a parent star's light. And that's actually not too hard in modern astronomy to monitor the brightness of a star to 1%. You can see that dimming and start up again. A small planet like the Earth would only block out about 0.01% of a parent star's light for a star as big as the sun. So it blocks out about one part in 10,000. That is something you can't possibly measure from a ground-based telescope, because you look up in the sky, the Earth's atmosphere is very dynamic, um, and you don't have enough stability to monitor that very tiny brightness change. And so to find planets that small, you have to go to space. Space, there's no atmosphere, you can stare at a star for a very long period of time, there's no uh, daylight, there's no bright sky to get in your way, and you can stare at a patch of sky for a long time. And so, uh, as I mentioned, the amount of dimming tells us the size of the exoplanet, right? This is a bigger planet, and this, this is a smaller planet. Another thing you can tell is actually how far the planet orbits from its parent star. So, uh, if, if the, uh, a planet will transit, let's say it transits every 100 days. It'll pass in front of the star in 100 days. 100 days later, you'll see it again. A hundred days later, you'll see it again. And uh, Kepler, in the 1600s, Kepler has, has his third law that helps us figure out, based on how fast the orbit is, how far the planets are from their parent star. So Earth, we're in a one-year orbit. We're closer to the star. Jupiter, for instance, is five times farther away than we are. It orbits every 12 years. So seeing how quickly an orbit occurs tells us something about how far the planet is from its parent star. And so that's, that's a lot of information we already have just from seeing the star dim. We know how big the star is, we know what its orbital period is, and we know how far it is from the star. So that's a lot of information with a pretty small investment, a pretty small measurement. So this is Kepler, uh, a, a painting of him from the early 1600s. I, I really like his facial hair. I could probably learn a few things from him. Uh, seems to be a snazzy dresser, too. Um, 
Uh, in the early 1600s, he was the first person to, re to really uh, be able to understand the motion of the planets, and that's still his modern theory we, we still use today. Uh, he was able to predict the motion of the planets far into the future. He, he, he could tell on a, on a particular day where the planets would be with very high accuracy. And he was able to predict that as seen from Earth, the planets Mercury and Venus would occasionally pass directly in front of the sun as we see it at Earth. Uh, and so he actually predicted that in 1639, after he had passed away, that uh, Venus uh, would transit directly in front of the sun. This is a painting of a scientist named Crabtree who I think there's probably a little bit of artistic license. I'm not sure his whole family was here to watch, but uh, he could see Venus passing directly in front of the sun. And he was probably the, unless there was a very strange coincidence or a very lucky person, probably the first person to ever see this, of course, passing right in front of the star. Because uh, you know, telescopes had only been invented a few decades earlier. And so, of course, this would be projected on a screen. He wouldn't, of course, stare directly into the telescope. Uh, there are two recent transits of Venus, which some of you might have seen. Uh, one was 2004 and one was 2012. There's me right there with my son, Finn, two years ago in 2012. We're looking through a telescope with a, with a solar filter on it. Um, if you wanted to see that transit, I hope you did, because the next one's in the year 2117. Uh, it's, it's not a very common occurrence. Um, Mercury transits a little bit more commonly, so I think there's one coming up in a few years, but it's a lot harder to see. Uh, historically, the transits of Venus were very important. I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, the exact timing of the transit uh, allowed us to actually measure the scale of our solar system. So historically, transits of Venus were, were very important to understanding exactly how far away we were from the sun in, in kilometers and actually knowing the scale of our own solar system. This is just a picture I put up for fun. This is from the 2004 transit. This is the Earth rising off the coast, sorry, this is Earth rising, the sun rising off the coast of Florida, off the eastern coast of Florida. Uh, the transit had already started, and there's a pelican, and there's Venus, and there's a fisherman. This is one of my favorite, very cool images from the Venus transit in 2004. <coughs> Of course, we, we do see other shadows being cast on Earth more often. This is, a, this is a view from the International Space Station of a total eclipse. This is the sun, uh, this is the moon passing in front of the sun, casting its shadow on the surface of the Earth. So if you were down there, you would see a, a, total, a total solar eclipse, right? And so a transit, of course, is a lot like an eclipse, uh, but uh, the scale's a little bit different, just a tiny fraction of the star's light's being blocked out, whereas on Earth, when we see an eclipse, we see essentially all, the parents, all of our parent star's light being blocked out. So I want to talk a little bit more about, about the Kepler mission, now that you know about planetary sizes and you know about um, how transits work. So the idea of the Kepler mission was by uh, a gentleman named Bill Baruki, who still works at, at NASA Ames Research Center. And he came up with this idea in the 1980s, before any exoplanets had even ever been discovered. He had this idea that we could use this transit method to find planets around other stars with a space telescope. Actually, the Hubble Space Telescope hadn't even been launched yet. And so the idea is that if you sample a very large number of stars, and you measure that, let's say you measure that there are no planets around a large number of stars. That tells you something very important. If you only monitor, let's say, 10 stars, and you don't find any planets, it doesn't really tell you very much because you only sampled a small number of stars. But if you monitor, let's say, 100,000 stars, and you don't see any planets, that pretty definitively tells you that there probably aren't any planets in the galaxy, or they're very, very rare. So the idea is that if you measure a very large number of, planet, of stars, you have a good statistical sample to tell you what the galaxy in total might be like. Even though there's 100 billion stars in the galaxy, you couldn't monitor them all, but if you monitor a large sample size, that's probably representative of the whole sample. And so what Kepler is, is really a, a 100 megapixel space camera, which is like a little digital camera, but much larger scale. And it, all it does, it measures the brightness of 150,000 stars for four years without blinking, or only rarely blinking. And so this is what uh, the plane of the Milky Way galaxy looks like. There's the constellation Cygnus. 
And so the Kepler, this, uh, this kind of postage stamp little area, that's what Kepler uh, has been looking at. Um, it's uh, about 42 CCD panels. It doesn't look directly in the plane of the galaxy, because there's actually too many stars there. It's too crowded with stars. It's actually confusing. So it looks slightly out of the plane of the galaxy, slightly inclined, where there's still a lot of stars, but it's not, it's not too dense with stars. It looks something like this. So we're about, you know, people say we're in the suburbs of the Milky Way, and that's about right. We're about two thirds of the way out or so. And so uh, Kepler is looking just at a very narrow patch of our Milky Way. Uh, it's looking back, uh, most of the average Kepler star is around, oh, 500 to 3,000 light years kind of in here. And it's looking at about 150,000 stars. Uh, and it's in particular looking at Earth like stars. And the reason why we want to do that is that what Kepler can actually measure is we want to know the fraction of sun-like stars that have an Earth-sized planet in an Earth-like orbit. So that's really, I would say, one of the most profound things in science, if not in astronomy of all of science, that you could, you could measure. What fraction of sun-like stars do have an Earth-sized planet in an Earth-like orbit? And so to do that, you have to stare in this patch of sky for many years, because you can imagine if you're looking at our solar system from afar, you would only see Earth come around to transit once per year. It would last, I think, maybe about 15 or 20 hours, then you have to wait a whole nother year. And so if you stare at a patch for four years, then you'd see three or four transits, and that would give you confidence you, you, you saw the real thing. If you only saw one transit or two, you're not sure what you're really seeing. If you see three or four, then you know you're seeing a real phenomenon. So that's why the Kepler mission was designed to, pat, to look in one patch of the sky almost constantly for about four years. This is very different than like uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, which can see in the ultraviolet, the infrared, the optical, it can do imaging, it can do spectra, it can point anywhere in the sky. Kepler really doesn't have any instruments. It's just a big camera uh, by the, with a one meter sized telescope and it points directly in that patch of the sky. It collects all the data. Every 90 days, it sends the data back to Earth. It takes a day or two. Then it goes back to that patch of the sky. And that's all it does. It's a very purpose-built instrument. And so the way it finds planets is, like when we mentioned, we're monitoring the brightness as a function of time. That's all we're doing. And so you imagine there's, a, there's about 100 there's a, about million pixels. And so what a, what a parent star looks like to Kepler is something like this. There's just this bright, bright blob that's a star kind of smeared out. And if you plot the, the brightness, this is just a measure of brightness versus time and hours, what you see, this is a, this is a very close-in planet. There's constant brightness, constant brightness. Uh, the, plant, the star's light is blocked out for a few hours, then it goes back up again. This is a very small scale here. This is, again, this is five parts in 10,000. It's a very small scale. So we're monitoring very tiny brightness changes, but those brightness changes repeat over and over and over again. And so for this system, we can figure out this planet is about 1.4 times the radius of the Earth, this particular planet. And this planet's called Kepler 10b. It was the 10th planet found by the Kepler mission. So it's turning pixels into planets just by measuring how bright this this blob of pixels is, is a function of time. An analogy people have made, and this is pretty interesting, is if, if you had a very tall office building, dozens of stories, and all the lights were turned on, it was the middle of the night, every single window was on, the, the planet, the, the, the building was blindingly bright, and if someone pulled, and maybe there was uh, on the order of 100 or 1,000 windows, and if someone pulled down a shade by about 10 centimeters or so, Kepler would be able to tell that tiny brightness difference if one window shade was pulled down by about 10 centimeters. It's a very tiny effect. And so the reason why people are interested in finding planets in one-year orbits around sun-like stars is that we know here on Earth we have liquid water on our surface. If a planet's much further away from the sun, it's colder and liquid water would freeze out. If you're much closer to, the, to your parent star, it gets hotter and all your water evaporates. So in our solar system, we've got Earth, very nice, very temperate. 
You've got Mars, which appears to be very cold now, probably and too cold for there to be surface water. For Venus, Venus is hotter. It's so hot that liquid water is unstable at the surface. It all evaporates. So people call this the habitable zone. The habitable zone is a region around a star where you could conceivably have liquid water at the surface, because we think liquid water is perhaps the most important ingredient for life. So this is the radius of an orbit relative to the Earth's orbit, one times the size, 10 times bigger, 40 times bigger. This is the mass of a, of a star. So this is a star the same mass as the sun. This is a star twice as massive as the sun, a star half as massive as the sun. Bigger stars are brighter. So if you're around a sun-like star, you want to be in this nice, happy blue region where the Earth is. If you're around a brighter star, that's a, that's a, that's a hotter, brighter campfire. You want to be further away from it to still be at the same temperature. If you're around a faint, cool red star, then you actually want to be quite a bit closer in to be able to have a warm atmosphere where you might potentially have liquid water. And so the Kepler mission then is to look at sun-like stars looking for planets in the habitable zone. So these are really um, one-year orbits. That's the time scale. And so it's these planets in the habitable zone that we think are, are perhaps the ones most likely to have life as we know it, at least. So Kepler, this is what it looks like. This is a person for scale. It's about a one meter telescope. These are the solar panels on the side. It's optimized to finding small planets, about 0.75 to one and a half Earth radii. Uh, and it's continuously monitoring, I mentioned about 150,000 stars. And so the mission was completed very recently because the telescope, uh, um, well, it's a little bit broken now. We'll come back to that at the end. Uh, but it monitored for almost exactly four years. And that's exactly what it was designed to do. The mission was designed for three and a half years, and it actually made it out to four years. OK, so this is a diagram that shows the number of planets being found as a function of time. We've got years down here. And we've got different planets being found. I'll go back. I'll do this one more time after it finishes. This is the radius of planets relative to Earth. We've got an Earth size, a Neptune size, and a Jupiter size. This is the orbital period in days from one day to 10 day to 100 days. One of the almost crazy things about, exopla about exoplanets is that we now know that planets can exist in periods of like a day. So we go around in 365 days. Mercury goes around in 88 days. We can find other planets that go around in less than a day. So there's different colors here. This is the Doppler wobble method we talked about. This is the transit method. These are other methods. This is taking pictures of planets and some other methods we're not really going to talk about. So we're going to start this up again. It starts in 1989. So we've got a few Doppler wobble planets. In 1999 is the first transiting planet right there. That happened my second month in graduate school. That got me very excited about exoplanetary systems. And so as time goes on, we're building up a sample of planets, more and more planets. And we're, we're finding planets at longer period orbits. We're finding, perhaps, oh, let's start it again. We're finding smaller planets. OK, this is where we are. So we'll go to 2009 to 2012 and 13. So 2009 was when the Kepler mission was launched. We'll go that. Okay, 2009. This is what we knew at the time of Kepler's launch. So people were finding more transiting planets. People were especially finding planets in this region here because planets uh, that are big and close to their star are easier to find. So we might have had a very strange view of what planetary systems looked like. But with Kepler here, we've got this yellow sample. So compare this back and forth. What Kepler showed us is that there were tremendous numbers of planets that we weren't seeing. They were just too hard to see without a space telescope. So Kepler added 3,500 planets to around the 600 that were known at the time. So it was a tremendous sea change in understanding planetary systems. So although it seemed like these Jupiter-sized planets were probably pretty common, in reality, we found that compared to the smaller planets down here, uh, the giant planets were actually quite rare. 
So there's, there's a tremendous number of planets that were found below the size of Neptune, planets below about four Earth radii. And so Earth sits right here at one Earth radii in 365 days. And so this is really uh, an amazing transformation in our knowledge of planetary systems. That there were untold, there were uh, very large numbers of planets down here that we had not seen before. This is just a very short movie of a sampling of some of the hundreds of planetary systems that Kepler found. So it's just a movie, it's a short movie of planets orbiting their parent star. Uh, if you watch it on YouTube, there's, there's, some, there's, some, there's some music to go along with it too, it's kind of cute. Um, and so basically what you see is just there's a variety, these are all two, three, four, five, and six planet systems. And so we essentially found hundreds of new solar systems that we hadn't seen before. And orrery is a, is, a, is a model of a solar system. So before we end up, before we move on to talking about um, how common Earth-sized planets might be with this data, I want to mention some of the uh, really paradigm-changing planets that Kepler's found, really strange objects. So this is uh, Kepler 10b, which I mentioned maybe about five minutes ago. This is a five Earth-mass planets in a 20-hour orbit. The day side is so hot, it, it glows much, much brighter than, than, than iron in the fire. Uh, and the whole day side really essentially has to be lava because the day side temperature is so hot. And so we could do a little movie of what this might look like. Um, so this is the parent star. The parent star looks a lot like the sun. It's very similar to a, a sun-like star. It's a bright yellow star. The planet's so close in that the star takes up a, a tremendous amount of the sky, right? In our, own, in our own system, the sun is, you know, pretty small in the sky, whereas in this system, the, sc the star is amazingly uh, large in your sky. And so uh, uh, on this day side, it's about 2,500 degrees Celsius, we estimate. So people sometimes call this a, a lava ocean planet because most of the day side, given the temperature, has to be molten rock. Uh, and this movie goes on for quite a while. We might fly in through the imaginary caverns for a while, but I think we'll, we'll stop it in a second. This is just, an, of course, an artist's rendering of what it might be like to be on this planet. Um, we do know the day side really has to be about 2,500 degrees. And this is not the only planet that looks like this. People have, we've found other planets very much like this around other stars. Um, hot rocks, hot lava ocean planets. Another system that was uh, very important in, in, in expanding our view of what planetary systems could look like was called the Kepler-11 system. And so Kepler-11 has this very nice cover of this uh, publication called Nature, Six New Worlds. Uh, it was a compact six-planet system. And what's striking about this system is that there's five planets, all much larger than Earth, all orbiting within the orbit that Mercury has around our sun. Of course, within Mercury's orbit in our star, it's empty. There's no planets within Mercury's orbits. In this planetary system, around this sun-like star that looks almost exactly like the sun, there happens to be five densely packed-in planets all within a 50-day orbit. And so what that looks like, this is what actual Kepler data looks like for this system. This is the brightness of the star versus time. This is about 400 Earth days. And what you see is the, 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 the star is pretty constant in its brightness over time. But what you see is all this, this fuzz, this hair. And so what's happening there is planets are blocking the parent star. They're passing in front of the parent star over and over and over again. So the little yellow ball is a planet that orbits every 10.3 days. The little red ball, a planet that orbits every 13 days. There's a little gray ball that orbits every 118 days. There's a cool thing over here where three planets simultaneously are passing in front of the star at the same time which is what the artist was trying to draw over here. And so this is a, a densely packed planetary system of planets all larger than the Earth, all within a 50-day orbit. And this is not the only system we've found that looks like this. It's not tremendously common, but it is a system, it's a way of maybe making planetary systems that people really had no way of conceiving until we saw something that looked like this. 
This is, oh, this is a movie of Kepler-11. I'll suck this in there. This is, um, you see the planet, you see the star dimming, dimming, dimming. Then we're going to zoom in. And so it's tightly packed, five planets close in and one slightly further out. The one slightly further out is about Mercury, is about um, Venus's orbit. And so if you put in, uh, if you imagine them shooting off exhaust behind, this is, helps you see what the orbits look like. So it's a densely packed planetary system. Uh, Mercury's orbit would be kind of right out here. And this is not the only one that looks like this. One of the things that's been interesting to me to think about is uh, our planetary system, you could imagine it being slightly more packed. You could imagine the planets being closer together. Or you could imagine, let's say, Venus being closer to Earth. Or you could imagine Venus being a little bit larger. Let's say Venus was twice the Earth's radius. What that would have meant, if Venus was closer to us or larger, is that you might have been able to see that Venus had phases forever, right? We couldn't, Galileo was the first person to see that Venus went through phases with his telescope. And that proved that Venus actually orbits around the sun, not around the Earth. But if Venus had been about twice as big in our sky, uh, people with really good eyesight would actually have been able to see that Venus went through phases. And people would have known since antiquity that Venus orbited around the sun and that not everything orbited around the Earth. And you can imagine how the whole history of human thought and our place in the universe might have been different if Venus had been closer to us or bigger than us. And I hadn't really thought about that until about six months ago, thinking about this Kepler-11 planetary system. And it just shows you that um, there's just a variety of different ways to build planetary systems. And the, the inhabitants of those worlds, if there are any, uh, might have a very different view of what planetary systems look like, depending on what their own system looks like. This is another cool system. This is, uh, <coughs> this is uh, Tatooine from the movie Star Wars. So Tatooine was a desert world. Uh, that had two parent stars, right? This is a classic shot. And so Kepler-16 looks a lot like this. Kepler-16 was the first planet found to orbit around two parent stars. And so George Lucas, I think, might have known a lot more than we give him credit for, because amazingly, this is what he, uh, his movie looked like, The Sunset with Luke Skywalker. This is what the, uh, the Kepler-16 system looks like. There's a yellow star and a red star, a yellow star and a red star. And this is a Kepler-16, a Saturn-like planet that orbits around two parent stars. And we now know that these planetary systems are, are fairly common. We're still, only about four of these have been found, but they're actually quite hard to find. And so we're, we're still trying to gauge how common they are, but they definitely exist. This is another movie I want to show you of what this might look like uh, being in orbit. Again, this is a Saturn-like planet. It's around 100 Earth masses, the same mass as Saturn. And it's got a big parent star and a small parent star. And the little parent star moves around the big one. And the big one makes a little wobble. And this is, this is in about 150-day orbits around its two parent stars. And the reason why you could find it in Kepler data is that the whole system is edge on. So you can see this one planet pass directly in front of both of its parent stars. And one of the ways that people can get involved in Kepler if they want to, there's a very nice website called planethunters.org. And at planethunters.org, you can actually, with your own eyes, analyze Kepler data to look for planets. So you might ask, well, aren't computers doing the same thing? Well, yes, certainly. But uh, one of the things about, about planets that have two parent stars is that it actually can get extremely complicated for a computer to figure out if there's a planet there because um, sometimes the planet transits in front of the big one first, sometimes it transits in front of the small one. A while later, the stars are in a different orientation. And so the timing of the transits is different every single time. And it's hard to teach a computer to search for that pattern because it changes every single time. And so out of the um, five um, circumbinary planets, two of them actually were found by human eyes and three were found by computer. And so if you search through Kepler data yourself, <coughs> you actually can find real planets. You actually can be uh, an author on published papers finding actual planets in Kepler data. This is called planethunters.org. It's run out of, uh, I think, Yale University. 
So I would definitely check that out if you want to learn more about Kepler. So I want to turn back now towards talking a little bit more about Earth-sized planets and potentially Earth-like planets. I'm using those words very precisely, okay? earth size versus Earth-like. So I mentioned this before. So this, are, these are, this is a sun-like star. This is a hotter star and a cooler star. This green region is meant to show the habitable zone, this region around the star where the temperature might be just right that you could have liquid water on the surface. If you're around a cooler star, you need to be closer into that cooler star in order to be just the right temperature. If you're around a bright, hot star, you need to be further away to have that just right temperature. People call this sometimes the Goldilocks zone. You don't want to be too hot, you don't want to be too cold. You want it to be just right. Uh, and so Kepler has not just been looking at sun-like stars, mostly sun-like stars, but also a fair number of cooler stars also. So Kepler-62 is the last particular system I'll mention. It's interesting because it's a mix of the familiar and the strange. So our own solar system is shown here at the bottom. We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So Earth is in the middle of the habitable zone. Mars is really on the outskirts out here. The Kepler-62 system has three, you might call crazy planets, really close into the parent star in a really tight orbits. But there's two stars further out, Kepler-62 E and F. And these stars are a little bit bigger than the Earth. They're about 40% bigger than the Earth. They look like they're probably rocky planets based on how big they are. We can't actually see them, of course. These are all just artists' rendering of what the planets might look like. All we know is how big they are. We just see their shadows, right? But these two planets look like they're in the habitable zone of their parent star, maybe a little bit like Earth and Venus to, to some degree. So this system looks a little bit like our own in that it has two rocky planets, kind of like an Earth-Venus distance, in addition to the three really close in, really hot, really compact systems. And so sometimes with Kepler, we can find planets in the habitable zone, but they don't always look exactly like we would expect. This is a five planet, very close in system. And this is another view of what the system might look like. I mentioned there's three very close in planets, very close to the parent star. Uh, the hottest one is again one of these hot lava worlds people have talked about, a lava ocean planet. And as you zoom out, we're going to color code it in green in a second. This green color coding is supposed to represent the habitable zone where the temperature might be right for liquid water. So we'll zoom out here. There's the three close in planets. And there's Kepler uh, 62 E and F out here in these outer two orbits where they might be in the habitable zone. So this is a, a scientific diagram, but I think it's very useful to just spend a minute looking at. This is, the, this is looking at all planets. This is based not just on a few particular planetary systems. This is a diagram made using 2,300 planetary discoveries. This was made last year when only about half the Kepler data had been analyzed. This is for sun-like stars, stars like the sun. The number of planets per star with an orbital period less than 85 days. So remember, we don't have any planets with a period less than 85 days. That's inter interior to Mercury's orbit. And what Kepler has found, this is the Earth, this is the size. These are gas giant planets, big Neptunes, small Neptunes, what people might call super Earths, big rocky planets, and Earths. And so within 85 days, remember, we have nothing. A couple percent of systems have a gas giants. More have a big Neptune. But amazingly, uh, where again, where we don't have any planets, this, these systems very commonly have a small-ish planet less than about three Earth radii. If you add up all these bins, it comes out to about two-thirds of all sun-like stars have a planet within 85 days. Again, we don't have anything of that. We don't have anything there. And these planets are quite commonly maybe two to four Earth radii. And again, in our solar system, we have Earth and Venus that are around one Earth radii. We've got Uranus and Neptune that are about four Earth radii. And we have nothing in between, nothing between one and four Earth radii. But we know nature very commonly makes things between one and four Earth radii. 
but we have no example in our own solar system of what these planets might actually be like. No example to go off of. To me, that's incredibly striking that we don't have planets where commonly planets are found, and we don't have what might well be the most common size of planet in our own solar system. <laughs> Another thing to think about <clears throat> is how common different size stars are. So you may have heard, perhaps for your whole life, that the sun is an average star. It's an average yellow star. That is really not true. It's average in the sense that you can find stars 10 times more massive than the sun. You can find stars 10 times less massive than the sun. So in that way, it's kind of average. But that's not really true because the smaller and smaller stars are, the more common they are. The bigger and bigger a star is, the less common it is. So these are all the stars within 30 light years of the sun, kind of our, our solar neighborhood. The biggest stars are called O and B stars, maybe three to 30 times the mass of the sun. There's none of those. The next size is an A star, maybe about twice the mass of the sun. There's four of those. The sun is a G star. It's classified as G, it's a yellow star. There's 20 yellow circles. Amazingly, the small, faint red stars, there's 246 of them within 30 light years. What's also interesting is that none of these stars can you see with your own eye, none of them, because all M stars are so faint, they're mostly shining the infrared. They ve shine very weakly in the light that we actually see. So our own solar neighborhood is dominated by faint red stars that we can't actually even see with our own eyes. If we had infrared eyes, we could see them. <clears throat> so whatever planetary systems form around M stars, by default, must be the most common kind of planetary system in our galaxy, because these faint M stars make up about 70% of all stars in our galaxy. So again, the sun is a sun-like star, and it's reasonably common, but 70% of all stars are faint red M stars. So again, whatever planetary system we find around M stars is the most common kind of planetary system in our galaxy. So again, this is big, bright O star, B. This is a G, like the sun. This is a faint red M, faint red M star. Big and bright, but rare. Small and red, but very common. If you look at Kepler data, you look at all the planets within about 50 days, what we see is that small M stars are really terrible at making big, gas giant planets. They essentially don't exist. Even Neptune-sized planets, they're just not there. What small stars are good at is making small planets. So there's lots of things below about three or so Earth radii. This is one Earth radius. This is an Earth-sized planet. If you add up all these bins, it's about one planet per star. If you go out to about 90 days, this is, a, this is made within about 50 days, you go to about 90 days, there's about one and a half planets per star within 90 days. So you can imagine, we now know planets are very common around these M stars, and they're common very close in, compact, small planetary systems. This is all the candidates in the habitable zone found by the Kepler mission as of a few months ago. This is uh, the approximate temperature in, in Kelvin. Sorry, I should have switched this to Celsius. Um, but this is a, well, it's a 270 degree difference. Uh, we've got Earth size, Neptune size, Jupiter size. And so what the planets that are hardest to find are the small ones, right? There's probably actually planets down here but they're hard to see because they block out such a small amount of their parent star's light. And so from all the Kepler data, from the, the 3,500 measured Kepler planetary systems, now remember, of course, we miss most of the planetary systems because we only see those that we see exactly edge on, right? But that's just geometry. You can take that into account. So based on the number of systems we've actually found, we can say, that about 10% of sun-like stars have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. This is not really all that precise yet because these planets are very hard to find. 
They transit only once per year. They block out a small amount of their parents' stars' lights. So this is an estimate based on about three-fourths of all the Kepler data being analyzed. So this number could change by maybe about a factor of two, but the number right now is about 10% of sun-like stars have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. For these faint red stars, which are the most common kind of star, we know that around 50% of them, 50% have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, closer in because they're fainter stars. So we know M stars are about 70% of all stars. There's around 100 billion total stars in the galaxy, maybe a little more. So that's about 70 billion M stars. You take about half of 70 billion, falls out, you get about 35 billion Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone in our galaxy. And this number has some uncertainty to it. It might be, it might be off by around 10 billion or so. But it's really, it's really, you can't escape the fact that we have tens of billions of Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone in our galaxy. And this is something that we're not guessing at. This is a, a measurement that's been made. And it's really it's a, a transformational discovery in understanding what our planet is like and comparing it to other planetary systems. So what we'd like to do eventually now is now that we've found planets, we've seen how big they are, we know how big they are from their parent star, we'd like to actually characterize what they're like. We'd like to know what their atmospheres are like, what their surfaces are like, what their atmospheres are made of. Of course, our atmosphere is very different than Venus's atmosphere. And so this is actually extremely challenging. This is a picture of Earth as seen from Saturn. So the Cassini spacecraft is at Saturn. Uh, it's looking back. This is a picture where it looks back towards the sun. It looks back towards the sun, but it's behind the sun, so the sun is blocked. And this is Earth. That's right there. That's our pale blue dot. That's what Earth looks like as seen, as seen from Saturn. I mentioned it's very hard to take a picture of a planet. Planets are 1 to 10 billion times dimmer than their parent star for a small Earth-like planet. So we may have to be a little bit more clever than that. So this is a very close-up picture of Venus passing in front of the sun. This is taken from an Earth-orbiting space telescope that points at our sun all the time, called SOHO. This is Venus passing in front of the sun. And what you might notice is this very faint ring over here. That is due to the atmosphere of Venus. That's due to scattering and refraction in the atmosphere of Venus. And believe it or not, this was actually noticed in 1739, or sorry, 1761, by a Russian astronomer named Lomonosov, who actually discovered that Venus had an atmosphere by projecting the transit on his wall and amazingly seeing this small effect that no one else noticed in the world at that, that time of that transit. And so what this meant, what this shows us, is that you potentially can learn something about the atmosphere of a transiting planet. You can imagine just a kind of a thought experiment. There's light from the parent star that passes through the planet's atmosphere on its way to Earth. And so this has actually been used for studying gas giant planets. You actually can see light from their parent star pass through their thin outer atmosphere and comes towards Earth, and we can actually measure molecules in Jupiter-like planetary atmospheres, water vapor, methane, carbon monoxide. So what we'd like to do is for smaller Earth-sized planets, this is of course a much, much harder measurement to make, we'd like to be able to see something similar to that. So in 2018, the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna be launching uh, October 2018. It's a six and a half meter space telescope. It's going to do a variety of things for astrophysics, but one of the things it's also going to try to do is for small planets that transit in front of these small, faint M stars, is to look for this light transmitted through the planet's atmosphere. We want to look for molecules in the planet's atmosphere. So for instance, for, for, um, uh, <coughs> for uh, Venus, 
Venus is a mostly CO2 atmosphere. So you can see lines, you can see absorption features due to CO2 molecules. In Earth, we have water vapor, oxygen, and some methane in our atmosphere. So you might be able to see the footprint of that in Earth's atmosphere. For Mars, Mars again mostly has a CO2 atmosphere. You might be able to see, to see CO2 lines. So the James Webb Space Telescope is not going to point all over the sky detecting the atmospheres of hundreds of planets. If there's a particular planet around a very nearby bright M star, you could have, people will probably want to use a tremendous amount of telescope time to observe transits over and over and over again for that one planet to detect uh, the molecules in that planet's atmosphere. So maybe around the year 2025, if you're paying attention, uh, several years into the James Webb mission, there will probably be the detection of perhaps some molecules in a small planet's atmosphere. Whether or not it's a habitable planet, or it might be too hot or too cold, we'll have to see. This is something people want to do. Uh, in the longer term, we'll probably have to build an even more sophisticated space telescope if you want to actually take pictures of Earth-like planets. That's really everyone's goal in the longer term. If you have a picture of a planet, you can just sit on it and take a very long, detailed spectrum to figure out what it's really made of. But the next step, which isn't really too far away, five, 10 years from now, is looking at this light with the James Webb Space Telescope. So I have two slides left. Uh, my concluding thoughts are these. <coughs> Nature is a bit more creative than we are in making planetary systems, perhaps except for George Lucas. We're only just beginning to understand how planetary systems are built. Our theories for how planetary systems were built for a long time were based on a sample size of one. We had one system to look at, now we have thousands of systems to look at, and we're just coming to grips with what this actually means about how planets form. There are, there's very solid evidence now for tens of billions of planetary systems in our galaxy that have an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. That doesn't necessarily mean those planets have to have water. That doesn't mean they're habitable, but they have the potential, and we know that they're there. Our system is perhaps a bit rare in that it's not really the typical layout that we see. So it's a little rare in that regard, but it's actually perhaps fairly common in that we know one Earth radius planets in the habitable zone of stars is a pretty common thing. So in some degree we're rare, to some degree we're common. It's not really a, a yes or no type of, type of thing. Um, and also that the next stage is to characterize the planets themselves, to figure out what their atmospheres are made of. And that's going to take um, a lot of, of money, a lot of time, and a lot of patience. It's not something we're going to do just in the next few years. We have to have a lot of patience and dedication to figure out what these atmospheres are like. So I want to come back to this slide I started out with. So what Kepler has again showed us is, is, is made a map, the first map we have of what planetary systems are like. We know what the architecture of systems look like where planets commonly are, where planets commonly aren't, and how planetary systems are built. What we haven't done yet is gone in to the inlands, spent hundreds of years and thousands of kilometers figuring out what the continents are like on the, in, on the inside, you know, where, where the forests are, where the rivers are. And to me, that's what it's going to be like for characterizing the atmospheres of other planets. What are they made of? How hot are they? That's a whole other step we'd like to take, but it's going to take a while. But I think that's going to be the most exciting part of astronomy over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Thanks a lot. <laughs>